It means to share your toys with your brother and sister. If someone's not playing with anybody and just is sitting under the slide, sad, you could play with them. If you don't be kind, um, no one would would like to play with you, and they would just think like you were born mean. Gentle means to be soft on it, like not hitting someone super hard. Instead of jumping on someone to hug them, maybe you can just walk up to them and hug, see if you can hug them. You might not always want to know the fact that your brother and sister are playing with your toys, so you might not want to give them to them. I should know. I have a brother that doesn't do the things that I really want him to do with me. Sometimes when I just need person space. <laughs> No, it's not really hard to be kind because if they're like hurt, you might like uh, give them a band-aid or a stitching. So this morning, this morning I have a three-part sermon. Don't be mean, don't hit hard, and give them band-aids and stitchings. <laughs> Let's close in prayer. In this world, we strive after a lot of different things. Money, success, Instagram likes, Facebook friends, security, toys. But I think really when we look down in the depths of our souls, the things that we yearn for are not these things. In fact, I don't believe that we truly long for things. Galatians 5, and 23 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The truth is that those things we really long for are things like love and joy and peace and forbearance, which is patience and kindness and goodness and self-control, and other things that money could never buy. These are the fruit of the Spirit. And as we've been talking about for the past couple of weeks, the fruit of the Spirit exists in our lives in relationship with the Holy Spirit. I know for many people, myself included, we have this expectation that if we become a Christian, if we decide to give our lives to Jesus, that the Holy Spirit will fill us up and this fruit will just appear. That would be like planting a tree in your yard and then waiting and waiting and waiting for the fruit. No watering, no feeding, no pruning. These are all essential to see fruit be born on these trees. And those are essential for the Christian life as well, if we are to see fruit. So week one, Pastor Kevin talked about God's sacrificial, never-ending, and personal love for us. A love so great, so grand, that it fills us up and then allows us to love other people. And last week, we looked at joy we were reminded that we should live joy-filled lives, not as some kind of act or some facade, but because God has been good and generous and his blessings overflow. Pastor Kevin shared that we can grow in our joy by daily remembering all of the blessings in our life and by sharing what God has placed in our care with a great attitude with others. And today, we're continuing with kindness. And we'll see that the, the fruit of the spirit of love and of joy have a place in kindness as well. So what is kindness? Well, according to thesaurus.com, there are a lot of synonyms for kindness. Here are just a few. Benevolence, charity, compassion, courtesy, gentleness, 
goodness, helpfulness, hospitality, mercy, philanthropy, sympathy, and thoughtfulness. I just grabbed a few from that list, but as you can see, the list is great and goes on and on. Today, specifically, we're going to look at three of these synonyms. While these are all great, these are wonderful words, three stand out to me. Compassion, mercy, and gentleness. I see, the, I see these three words, these attributes, these virtues as interwoven into like an elaborate fabric of how kindness can be the fruit in our lives. And I think as we look at these three words and how they work together, the best place to start is with Jesus. And I believe Jesus is the perfect picture of compassion, mercy, and gentleness. So let's start by looking at Matthew 14, verses 13 and 14. And we read, when Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them. In Mark 6, 34, when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. The original Greek word that we translate into compassion is splach nitsama. And what it means is to be moved to one's bowels. Oh boy, I heard. <laughs> In 2018, that doesn't paint a very clean picture for us. It's not something that we think is too pretty. But the reality is, is that when we look at it, when this was written, the bowels were seen to be the place that was the source of love and of pity. Much like today we say some things come from the heart, they don't actually come from the organ that is the heart. It's metaphorical. But let's go back to those two passages I just read because I intentionally left some words out at the end of each of them. Matthew 14, 13 through 14, the last phrase in there says, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. In Mark 6, 34, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began to teach them many things. What being moved to one's bowels means is that practically speaking, this compassion doesn't stop at compassion. That Jesus didn't see the crowds and have compassion and then go about his day. But that he had compassion and then he was moved to take action. You see, true compassion leads to kindness. And often what we describe as kindness, I think, is really just being nice. I can tell you as I talk to my kids and, and even as we heard from the, the children on the video, when we talk about kindness, that's often what we're saying. When I tell my kids, be kind to one another, what I'm saying in that moment is be nice. Don't hit them. Give them band-aids and stitchings. <laughs> Just be nice. And being nice is a wonderful, wonderful start. But it's just that, a start. You see, when we have compassion for people, our hearts do break for them. And this should cause our feelings to lead us to care for others. Recently, I, I came across a, a, a passage that hit me in a, a profound way, different than I think it ever has, ever before. And it's found in Matthew 25. It's verses 31 through 40. I'd like to read it. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people, one another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed 
by my Father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or in need of clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers or sisters of mine, you did for me. When we care for others. We care for Jesus. Jesus himself said, when you do this for others, you do it for me. One of my favorite passages for many years in the Bible is Colossians 3.23. It says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, as though working for the Lord, not human masters. I truly believe that if we have that perspective, If our mindset is that everything we do in this world, we do it as though we're doing it for God, it it takes it to a whole other level. When I'm being a good husband, if my motivation is not pleasing my wife, but it's pleasing God, as much as I love my wife, the motivation is greater when I'm seeking to please God. When I'm trying to be the best dad I can, and my motivation is pleasing my Savior and not pleasing my kids, it takes on a whole other meaning. Can you imagine walking down the street and seeing Jesus on the sidewalk, hungry, and walking right by? Can you imagine seeing Jesus without clothes and saying, sorry, can't help you out today? Or seeing Jesus saddened and mourning, and not stopping to comfort him. I can't imagine doing that, and yet I do it every single day. See, because Jesus went on and said, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. That is a deep and profound statement that I believe should change our lives. I believe that should stir in us maybe some angst. But what am I doing for Jesus? And while our care for others is the same as care for Jesus, our concern for others is the same as concern for Jesus, I also believe that God delights in our kindness. When one of my children does something kind for one of their siblings, it puts a smile on my face. When I see them share or give the right of way or, dare I say it, hand over the remote, <laughs> it makes me feel good. How much more you think our actions of kindness Put a smile on the face of God. And I know with my kids, often they do something kind for a sibling because they know down the road they can call in that favor. (laughs) And at some point they're getting something back. But when they do it purely out of goodness and with no expectation whatsoever of getting anything back, that sits with me in a whole different way. In our lives, when we demonstrate kindness for someone who has nothing to offer us in return, that's the synonym, mercy. Pastor and author John MacArthur writes, mercy is seeing a man without food and giving him food. Mercy is seeing a person in need of love and giving him love. Mercy is seeing someone lonely and giving him company. Mercy 
is meeting the need, not just feeling it. You see, kindness has many synonyms. I started off with compassion, which is a feeling of empathy, of of sympathy, of of care, of concern, of a broken heart for those who are hurting. And then it has mercy, which is taking that feeling and turning it into something, meeting the needs. In James, second chapter, God uses James to, to tell us a little something about doing not just feeling. In verse 14, we read, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, be warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Dead doesn't mean that we have no faith. Dead doesn't mean we don't know Jesus. Doesn't mean that we haven't accepted Jesus as our Savior. It means that our faith is like a a tree that is not bearing fruit. A, A tree that maybe hasn't been watered, hasn't been fed, hasn't been pruned, and sits there dormant with nothing to show for it. I think an important thing to to visit here is that James is not talking about how we earn our way into heaven. He isn't talking about how we do something so God will start to love us or that he will accept us or he'll look past our sins and our failures and our weaknesses. It's not about that at all. It's about the fact that our deeds should be an outpouring of our faith. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. Over the last couple of years, I've begun to do my, my Bible reading a little differently. The truth is that I was often stuck in, and still am sometimes today, in trying to get through the reading. Like I'm doing a study, I'm doing a preparation to teach, I'm, I'm doing the daily reading. Like I got a lot of reading I got to do. I got to put the audio Bible on in the car so I can get it all in. And I think what happens is I often pass over some really key points in the scripture. And I think in Ephesians 2.10, I've done that a whole lot. You know, I think I've read this verse more times than I can count. And what I've always read in there is I'm supposed to do good stuff. That as a Christian, part of my life is to do good things. But as I read this in the last couple of months, it sat with me differently. And some key words in there really have stood out. First is the word handiwork. Some translations call it work of art. Others will call it a masterpiece but that God looks upon us as his prized creation. That should say something to us, that God has uniquely designed each and every one of us as an artist designs a work of art. Then it goes on to say, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. And that's where I get my do good stuff thing. Part of the Christian life should be to do good works. But I skip right over, created to do good works. You see, doing good works isn't just something that's part of our lives. It's the purpose of our lives. See, for whatever reason, God has chosen to use his people to do the good works in this world. That God has chosen to use us to feed the hungry to clothe those who need clothing, to meet those people's emotional needs who are hurting, to share Jesus with this world. We have been created in Christ Jesus to do good works. And God has prepared the way. 
Again, we can't forget that kindness and the rest of the spiritual gifts or spiritual fruit are a partnership with the Holy Spirit. God has prepared the way. He has created these opportunities in advance for us to do, but then it takes effort on our part. It takes action on our part. The third synonym that I said I wanted to talk about today is is gentleness. And gentleness is a little bit different than compassion and mercy because gentleness is singled out as a fruit of the Spirit as well. So not just to be underneath kindness, but, but separate from that. Gentleness is a hard one for me. I have never in my life, ever once, been accused of being gentle. (laughs) And the way that I've been looking at gentleness is that it's the attitude or the approach with which we carry out our kindness. Compassion is the, the feeling that we have that has our heart break for someone. Mercy is the actions And gentleness is how those actions are carried out. I'm the father of four, three daughters and a son, so there is a lot of girl in my world. (laughs) From tea parties to to dolls to, to softball. So many years ago, I started coaching softball. And I coached softball because it gave me an opportunity to be with my girls But beyond my own daughters, I wanted to see the other girls on the team learn the sport of softball. I wanted to see them be the very best they could possibly be. But more than the game, I wanted them to see as people, they could be the very best that they could be. I wanted to see them see their value as God's creations. I wanted to see them see themselves the way God sees them. I've had incredible opportunities to witness to softball players and their families. And I'm a loud, loud coach. I tell them at the beginning of the season, you're going to hear me yell a lot. But I'm never yelling at you. I'll be yelling to you. Because maybe I'll be in the dugout or I'll be over here in the third base box. But I got to make sure that you can hear me. So I'll be yelling. Just know I'm not yelling at you. I think I've always looked at that as my like little seasonal disclaimer. <laughs> Got that out at the coaches meeting, I'm good. So now every time I yell, I'm covered. Now without patting myself on the back, you got to hear this. The reason I coach is partly for me. But it's in big part because of kindness. It's because I want to see the lives of those girls changed. I'm kind, but oh, very rarely gentle. gentle. I'll be in the coach's box and the pitch will come and the girl doesn't get out of the way and it hits her. And I'll yell from the side, get to first. Getting hits is good as getting a hit. (laughs) And she's laying in the box. All too many times, God's actually elbowed me at that point. I'm changing a bit. So what if instead of yelling from the side, I I run out there and I get on my knee. I say, are you okay? Man, that ball was coming fast. I'm sure you're scared. You take your time. You're going to be okay. If we need someone else to come in, we can do it. You just let me know. Oh, you're okay. Let me help you up. Let me walk you down to first. (laughs) I still got my base runner. (laughs) But she had a different experience. I was still kind when I was coaching from the side yelling. But it's different when I'm coaching with gentleness. What a better picture of Jesus. The yelling from the side, the coming along and kneeling down. 
Obviously, we know. It's the kindness that's carried out with gentleness that's going to truly make the difference. You see, our faith, compassion, kindness, mercy, and gentleness are inseparable. If we are truly to be the best representation of Jesus, those have to be woven into this intricate fabric that is our Christian life. If one of those is missing, it's like a a beautiful blanket that has a string that's pulled out. And when you pull on that, it all falls apart. It's essential that these pieces go together. I've been praying for weeks for today. I've been praying that lives would be changed today. That each of us, myself included, would leave this campus different than we came. Because if we come in here Sunday after Sunday and we leave the same, if we do our daily readings and pray to God and listen to our Christian music in the car, and yet there's no fruit from that, then our faith is like James said, it's dead. That our lives should have a demonstration of our faith. And that good works and deeds should be part of that. So what I've been praying is that each of us here today could say, it is time for me to take action. Two weeks ago, when Pastor Kevin was talking about love, he said, love others when it is inconvenient, costly, and even painful. And as we talked about joy last week, Pastor Kevin said that we need to reflect upon the blessings in our life and we need to share what God has given us with a great attitude. You see the fruit of the Spirit, they all work together. And love is the virtue that binds it all together. So every week we have on our bulletin... um, some directives. We have some some suggestions of of how you can move this message in your life forward. And I love this. And I always want to point it out. There's a daily reading in here which allows to give you guidance of, of how to read your Bible. And it prepares you for next week so that when you come in, you've you've been exposed to to all of what the pastor is going to go through. And there's a message there of a verse that you can memorize or spend some time reflecting upon. And mine is therefore as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothed yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. You see, these aren't just items that are part of your life. To to clothe yourselves means to cover your entirety in these virtues. The prayer direction says, ask God to grow your compassion. Pray for the Holy Spirit to show you how to demonstrate kindness this week towards others in a way that you usually do not. There are many ways that we can grow our compassion and and allow our compassion to lead to kindness that is demonstrated through acts of mercy that are carried out with gentleness. It can be a smile. It can be a kind word. It can be so much more. You've probably heard the phrase, random acts of kindness. And it's catchy and it's pretty neat, but I think God wants us to carry out intentional acts of kindness. I believe that God wants us to be deliberate about how we live out this fruit. I don't think he just wants us to go through our day accidentally bumping around and, hey, if something comes up, maybe some kindness. I've been listening to the song For the One for weeks now. For the One is the song that our worship team so beautifully led us in during our giving back. I have allowed those words to become a prayer for me. Let me be filled with kindness and compassion for the one. The one for whom you love and gave your son 
for your humanity, increase my love. Help me to love with open arms like you do. A love that erases all the lines and sees the truth. Oh, that when they look in my eyes, they would see you even in just a smile. They would feel the Father's love. I've been praying that God would grow in me a compassionate heart. That I would allow that compassion to lead to action and that I would see this world the way he does. The truth that's been coming up for me a lot frequently is that unless something is planned, it rarely gets done. So how about you make a list of areas you can be kind? Identify true needs, set goals, make it a family or group activity. How about you look at the Bible and and look at some examples there We see make clothes for people, feed people, carry a load, offer hospitality, offer words of encouragement. And of course, I can't leave this out. The single most kind act you can ever, ever carry out in your life is to share Jesus with someone. And here at this church, we've got plenty of opportunities as well. Through our children's ministry, as we saw in the video, to to share Jesus with children, one of the greatest privileges we have in all the world. Through our community outreach, we have got food pantry and clothes closet and Valentine car making and feeding the homeless and women's shelter visits and Operation Christmas Child and Angel Tree and, 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 and so many opportunities. Through our care ministry, we have jail ministry, grief share, divorce care, meals, hospital visits, mental health support, Care Center, prayer partners who are up here on Sundays and lay counseling. In fact, today after third service, we've got a lay counseling training that's taken off. If you're interested in that, stop by. They'll they'll walk you in right there. But I have a challenge for you today. The challenge is would you commit to taking a step toward living out the fruit of kindness today? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I, uh, I thank you for loving us. I thank you for choosing to use us as your hands and feet and voice in this world. And Father, I pray that we would truly leave this place changed. Lord, I pray that the fruit of kindness would be evident in our lives and that through that, others would come to know you and your love for them. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.